Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Julianne Worden, and I will be your moderator this evening as we travel along with Rick and a special guest. Tonight, we are headed to Turkey, where we will find the convenience of European travel with the rich traditions of the Middle East. And now, without further ado, I'll turn things over to Rick Steves, who will be one of our tour guides this evening. Merhaba, Rick. Merhaba, Julianne. Thank you so much for the introduction. And thanks all of you for joining us again on Monday Night Travel. This is the night we look forward to, at least I look forward to. It's a time when we can just enthuse about travel, where we can celebrate our love of travel, where we can get to know the world better. And this is, we do this every Monday night. I think we've been doing this for nearly a, a year now. And uh, it's a chance for us to uh, just uh, share our passion. Uh, we invite some great guests and we go all over the place. Today, we're going to Turkey, one of my favorite countries. I remember when I was in my 20s, actually my late teens, for six or eight trips in a row. I didn't plan it, but every trip finished in Turkey. It was just the subconscious cherry on top of every European adventure when I was a backpacker. And then, oh, in the 80s, I met a, a, a guide named Malika, and we started doing tours to tour to Turkey. And then I met our guide that we're going to be joined with tonight, Lolly and her husband, who have a wonderful tour, tour program in Turkey. And we partnered with them in the 90s. And for about 25 years now, we've been taking our groups together around Turkey. Lolly is just such an inspiration. I'm so thankful that she's staying up the so wee hours in Turkey right now, and we're going to meet her in just a minute. I want to remind you that every Monday we get together, and uh, I'm going to be uh, on the road for the next three weeks. And if you go to ricksteves.com and you want to just, uh, oh, there's a, a shot of, I was just in the Alps. That was an amazing trip, and we're going to talk about that later. But when you go to ricksteves.com, uh, you go to Monday Night Travel, and then you can see what's cooking. Tonight, we've got turkey with Lolly. Uh, next week, I'm going to be in Europe. I'm going to be in Europe for three Mondays. So we've got Cameron Hewitt coming in, and Cameron's passionate about Iceland. He really knows Iceland. And um, when we, we're going to have an a evening with Cameron in Iceland, then we're going to go to Bulgaria with Stefan Bozhejev, and he's our guide in Bulgaria. And if you've never been to Bulgaria, you're in for a treat there. And then on November 1st, this is really going to be fun. It's going to be a round table with our Monday night travel crew. Julianne, Gabe, Lisa, all going to share their favorite places with Cameron. And then I'll be back on November 8th to do a special evening of Deathly Europe, talking about bones and cemeteries. So there's lots of great Monday night travel coming up. But right now, we want to go to Turkey. And I'm going to introduce Lolly in just a moment, but I found this old, old clip. It's, I don't know how old it is, but it's a, a long time ago in Turkey when I was just getting busy, uh, you know, to get to know Lolly and starting to work with her. And we're on one of my favorite streets in all of Europe. And I want to drop in right now and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll visit late on a Saturday evening, a thriving street in downtown Istanbul with Lolly. Join me now in the capital of Turkey. Cultural. Historic capital. Hi, I'm Rick Steves. It's about 10 o'clock on a Saturday night, and we're in Istanbul. I'm with my friend Lolly Sermon. Hello, America. And uh, Lolly, this street is called Istiklal Street. Istiklal. Istiklal. And it's just packed with people. The, it would be the modern, it would be the Turkish equivalent of a European square. Okay, and it is just no special occasion. This is just every night of the An week. An ordinary Saturday evening. Well, let's go take a look. Here we are. Now, this is our look at modern Istanbul. And, uh, you know, it's not necessarily just tourist. I mean, you got your chestnuts. Merhaba. <laughs> you got your music. You got your... Little grocery store, and you got your Turkish Turkish delights, and you got this crowd of people here. I mean, hi there, and you've got a bookstore with music. <laughs> And it's just classy. 
<laughs> it's just really classy. And this is one reason, this is one reason, this is one reason why I think Istanbul is one of the four greatest cities in Europe. You gotta love London, Rome, and Paris. But don't forget Istanbul. And specifically, Istanbul, Katasi. Thanks. Happy travels. Ciao. Merhaba. Gula gula. Merhaba. Hello. <laughs> Ciao. Merhaba. Gula gula. You know, that joy, I was just thinking, I, I was filled with joy there. I was not faking that joy. I, every time I'm in Istanbul, I marvel that there are tourists in their hotel rooms watching a movie in the evening. The evening. You know, Neil Diamond made a song a long time ago, Thank the Lord for the Nighttime, Forget the Day. Well, I'll tell you, in Istanbul, he must have been inspired by that. You want to be out in the nighttime. Thank the Lord for the nighttime in Istanbul. And I'm thankful for Lolly Sermon Aran because she has opened the door to so many of our travelers. Hey, there's my dogs. <laughs> hey, um, I want to remind you that we're going to be going through lots of Turkey. And right now, I'd like Lolly to join us. Lolly, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello, Rick. Nice to have you. What time is it and where are you? It is 10 after 5 a.m. It's almost breakfast time. I'm in my living room. And we're on our second show now, and we're having fun sharing Turkey as you do so well. Before we share Turkey, I know your, your family is, I hope, sleeping. Can you introduce this to your family? Do you have a, a photograph to Happily, share? Happily, I would, of course. Uh, there you are. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. This photo was taken in my living room. The child on my right is my older son, and his name is Kuzey. He's 14 years old. Yeah. He was a baby, a few months old, when you held him in your arms. That's right. And on the left is my younger son, Kaya. He is 12 now. And at the center is my husband. He is also my business partner. His name is Tom. <laughs> I thought you were going to say he's my third boy. Well, sort of. Sort it's of. behind the scenes, though. Behind the scenes. Well, you and Tan are great parents, and you're also a great tour company, and we are so thankful to be partnering with you. It's a big responsibility to be taking hundreds and hundreds of Americans to Turkey, and frankly, I wouldn't do it without a trusted Turkish partner. And how long have you and Tan been our partner for our Tur Turkey tour program? Over 25 years. Over 25 years. And, uh, you know, I brought most of my loved ones on a Turkey tour. I, I was took my mom and dad. I took my, our kids, I, I took our very best friends. Turkey is the most impactful of the tours that we offer. And we couldn't do it without our Turkish guides like you, Tan, and your staff. So thank you, thank you so much. And I'm glad you're with us tonight. We're gonna, uh, what, are you, what are you eating there, Lolly? I'm, I'm gonna show you my meze here. What do you have in Istanbul? Okay, I have a colorful plate uh, of mezes. Look at that. So we got we a feast and we're going to talk about these mezes later, but right now I want to get into the video and I just want to start off with a drink. So I've got, we're going to have some Rocky. Do you have some Rocky handy? I do. It's right here. And I oh. have the slender glass right for Rocky. Okay. I got I'm my ready glass. To pour it. It, it even says Rocky right there on it. So yes. Rocky. And here's my glass. Here's yep. my bottle. I'll show you how it happens. And then I'll do the same thing after you. Okay. We fill the bottom quarter of the glass with Rocky. Yeah. Like this. There you go. This is a very strong beverage. So, and so you want, want to dilute it. And this is where the magic works. This is water. And I'm going to slowly pour the water in my Rocky. It's a chemistry class, a very happy chemistry class. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. And mine is good to go now. Okay, now I got to admit, I don't have any Rocky, but I've got Ouzo, which is the Greek version. All over the Mediterranean, you find these licorice drinks. And uh, there's a lot of parts of Greek and Turkish cuisine that are similar, just different names. But it's the same kind of thing. So I'm going to call it Rocky right now. And I'll pour my... Yeah, and then you just add as much water as you like for your taste, right? Strong yes. or weak. And then you have the, uh, the, the magic. There you go. There we go. 
So how do we say cheers in Turkey? Şerefe. Şerefe. Şerefe Rick. Hmm. I love that licorice. It's so nice. Let's say Sherefe to all of our travelers who are watching on Monday Night Travel. Sherefe. Sherefe. All right. Now I'm ready to go to Istanbul with Lolly and all of our Monday Night Travel friends. Here we go. Istanbul's been a busy trading center from the start, so it needed to be well protected. This imposing wall helped fortify the ancient Byzantine capital. The wall sealed off the city, protecting it on the one side where the water didn't. Dating from the 5th century, these ramparts stood strong against both Catholic Europe from the west and the Muslim forces from the east, until 1453. Finally, the Ottoman Turks, who for centuries had been on the rise and chipping away at the Byzantine Empire, broke through the walls. They established the city as the capital of their growing empire and transformed Christian Constantinople into a Muslim city. Our storybook image of the Ottomans, sultans, harems, eunuchs, is best imagined here in the Topkapi Palace. Built in the late 15th century, this was the power center of the Ottoman Empire for almost 400 years. Its buildings form a series of courtyards, the outer being used for public functions. The further in you go, the more private the rooms. Among the most private was the harem. The word harem means forbidden in Arabic. It's the huge suite where the sultan lived with his wives, female slaves, and children. This is the largest room in the harem. It was the entertainment room and used for activities like the wedding of the sultan's daughters. This was the divan that the sultan used, his throne. The divans by the window were used by the queen mother and the wives of the sultan. And the musicians used the balcony up above. But when I say a party, do not imagine a public event. It was rather for the family of the sultan. So just a small family affair. The sultan, his mom, his wives, and his girlfriends. His favorites. The whole purpose of the harem was to provide future heirs to the throne, to the Ottoman throne. But most of the tourists think that it was a party place, a fantasy place. It was not. It was an institution that had its own rules. It was very well regulated, and these rules were very strict. The sultan was not above these rules. So the sultan didn't just come in and pick a girl? Definitely not. It was the queen mother, mother of the sultan, mostly, that decided what should happen in the harem. And it was again the queen mother that decided whom the sultan socialized with. And of course, the sultan enjoyed a state-of-the-art bathroom, complete with hot and cold running water. Bathed in light from these exquisite stained glass windows, this is where the sultan relaxed, entertained, and savored the sumptuous luxury his power provided. Some of the sultan's opulence is still on display in the palace museum. The exquisite top copy dagger wows tourists with its dazzling diamonds and golf ball-sized emeralds. Clearly, the Ottomans in their heyday were a wealthy power. The palace is also a holy spot for Muslims containing relics of Muhammad and other prophets, some of whom are revered in both the Bible and the Quran. This contains what's considered to be the arm of St. John the Baptist. And here's John's skull inside this jeweled case. For Muslims, the most precious relics are those of Muhammad. His bow and sword, exquisite cases containing his tooth, some hair, and his holy seal. <laughs> And in the adjacent room, a hafiz, that someone who's memorized all 6,000 verses of the Quran, is part of a team that sings verses from the Muslim holy book 24 hours a day, seven days a week. For generations, Europe dreaded the Ottoman threat. They were on the march, even knocking on Vienna's fortified door. But through the 19th century, a combination of corruption incompetent sultans, and an antiquated medieval organization all contributed to the eventual fall of the Ottoman Empire. Turkey. Oh, my goodness. Lolly, all that history stokes my appetite. 
Yes, mine it's, too. It's five o'clock in the morning for you. It's dinner time for me. Let's have dinner. Okay. Take us on a tour of your beautiful meze plate. Can you please? Yes. Mm. Meze, uh, we love our mezes and meze is basically an appetizer. We eat them before the main course. And on my platter to my right is an eggplant dish, which we love very much. It's mixed by, it is cooked by uh, mixing the onions and tomatoes. And on my left here is a salad made of pomegranates, walnuts, peppers, tomatoes, parsley. The little two fellows in the front of my plate are sarma, S-A-R-M-A. -A. In um, America, you get to call these dolma. But as a matter of fact, these are sarma. Dolma means stuffed, and you cannot stuff leaves. You can roll the leaves, so they are rolled, sarmas. And do these two guys closer to my face, you, uh, green and red, are stuffed peppers. So these are dolma. Oh. And at the middle, I have uh, sour pickled beets. So that looks just delicious, Lolly. And you can stuff a pepper. But you yes, can't, you can't stuff, stuff a pepper. You just can't stuff a grape leaf. No. So let's stop calling grape leaves stuffed. I agree. You know, one of my favorite <laughs> ways to my one of my favorite ways to travel around Turkey, especially in the old days, was on a dolmush. It's dolmush. the same word. Yeah, it was a minibus, and it had eight seats, and it had about fourteen people. And we still have them. And what's the name? Dolmush. It's also stuffed. So it means stuffed. You can stuff your pepper or you can stuff your minibus. It's a good word to know, domush. Exactly. Okay, I've got my meze, and you know my meze better than I do, but I've got in the corner on the far right of mine uh, beans that were marinated in garlic overnight. I've got the, this red dish, which is really nice. That is uh, a kind of beet hummus. And I've got some roasted uh, red peppers there on my left. And I've got some kefir cheese with yogurt. And this is all from a restaurant in Seattle called Cafe Turku. And we like to remind people during pandemic time here that we want to keep our independent restaurants thriving. And we want to remember that we can support them so they can get through this darn pandemic. And we're doing that when we enjoy food from different countries. So, and I've got my little um, no longer stuffed grape leaves, but what are we, Sarma in the middle. Sarma, yes. Sarma. So I am really enjoying this. And that is a meze. We know that word from traveling in Greece, and it's the same word in Turkey. We, we take our, our bread and we dip it in. And it's a very social way to eat, isn't it? Yes, it is. You mm. can either dip your bread into it or spread the meze on your bread or use the flat bread like the kind I have with me. Mm -hmm. You can put your meze in it and roll it. Oh. And make a wrap. And then it's kind of stuffed. Yes, it is. Or <laughs> rolled. It's sarma. All right. Now we're going to enjoy our meal with a little better understanding. And we're going to go back to our video and learn about Turkey. Istanbul. Here we go. This is Europe and Asia. Istanbul, its largest city and commercial center, straddles the strategic Bosporus Strait. Part of the city is in Europe and part in Asia. The Golden Horn Inlet divides the new town with its high-energy business zones from the old town, where you'll find the major sites. As a city which is over 90% Muslim, Istanbul offers a good opportunity to better understand Islam. <laughs> Visitors are welcome to visit historic mosques and at the same time experience a religion that still packs the house. The Blue Mosque was the 17th century triumph of Sultan Ahmet I. Architecturally, with its six minarets, it rivaled the Great Mosque in Mecca, the holiest in all Islam. Its grand courtyard welcomes the crowd that gathers for worship. As with all mosques, you park your shoes at the door, and women cover their heads. If they don't have a scarf, there are loners at the door. Countless beautiful tiles fill the interior with exquisite floral and geometric motifs. It's nicknamed the Blue Mosque because of its blue tiles. Blue is a popular color in Turkey. 
it impressed early French visitors enough for them to call it the color of the Turks, or turquoise. Well, so I want to take just a moment here because I'm working very hard on a new TV series. It's an art series, European art, a six hour special. We're going to have it done in about a year, taking us from the pyramids to Picasso. And we're, we're going through all of the great art we've featured in the last years on our TV show. And I found this little clip here that explains the um, Muslim uh, aesthetic of uh, not images, but uh, calligraphy and design and why. And this is just in the next 90 seconds, it's an example of the information and the beautiful material that we're going to pull from our show and weave it together in this six hour series. Next Friday, I'm flying to Europe. First of all, I'm meeting 20 of our guides. I've got a bunch of new guides and we're going to train them, put them on the fast track to guiding tours. And they're going to know the Rick Steves way of guiding tours. So I'll be meeting them in uh, Rome with a couple of our lead guides here and our staff. And we're going to let the guides be the tour members and we're going to show them how to do a Rick Steves tour. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And when that's over, I'm going to meet the crew, Carl and Simon in Florence. We're going to spend four days in Florence, four days in Rome, and four days in Athens shooting great material to finish off three of the hours of this six-hour art special that's coming up. But here's an example, just 90 seconds or so, of the beautiful art that we'll be weaving together in this, for me, very exciting new opportunity to teach the wonders of European culture. Churches portray people like this. Muslims believe the portrayal of people in places of worship draws attention away from worshiping Allah as the one God. In mosques, rather than saints and prophets, you'll see geometrical designs and calligraphy. This explains why, historically, the Muslim world excelled at non-figurative art, while artists from Christian Europe focused on painting and sculpture of the human form. Artful Arabic calligraphy generally shows excerpts from the Quran and quotes from Muhammad. As a church would have Jesus and God front and center, in a mosque, elaborate signature medallions high above the prayer niche say Muhammad and Allah. Large ceremonial candles flank the mirab. That's the niche which points southeast to Mecca in Saudi Arabia, where all Muslims face when they worship. Services are segregated by gender. The main hall is reserved for men, while the women's section is in the back. While to some it's demeaning to make women stay in back, Muslims see it as a practical matter. Women would rather have the option of performing the physical act of praying in private. Like churches have bell towers, mosques have minarets. According to Muslim tradition, the imam or prayer leader would climb to the top of a minaret to call the faithful to prayer. These days, the prayer leader still performs the call to prayer live, but it's amplified by loudspeakers at the top of the minarets. The call is always the same. Allah Akbar, God is great. Witness there is only one God. Muhammad is his prophet. Come join the prayer. Come join the salvation. When this happens, practicing Muslims drop into a mosque, face Mecca, and pray to God. Then, after a short service praising God, workaday life resumes. Modern Turkish culture is complex. To sort it out properly, I'm joined by my Turkish friend, Lali Sermin Aran, who co-authors my Istanbul guidebook. So what does the call to prayer mean to you? See, it's a personal thing. Most of these people you see are, here are probably Muslims, but Turkey is a secular country. It's in our constitution. But on the other hand, we say that you never know who has got the money or the faith. The real virtue is not to show it off. Hey, uh, Lolly, can we just take a minute here? I'd love to have you share for our uh, travelers about the, um, in Turkey, the whole idea of a scarf. Uh, a lot of Americans wonder, is it required? Why do women wear it? Are there different ways to wear it? Uh, what's the modern approach to a scarf? The traditional uh, 
understanding of Islam requires women to cover their hair. And in Turkey, which is a secular country, women have the option and they don't have to ask anyone's permission. They can decide for themselves. So some of them wear scarves, some of them don't wear scarves. I am a Muslim Turkish woman, but I am a non-scarf wearing one. While even though when visiting mosques, I would still cover my hair due to my respect, out of my respect to the mosque and more, of, more than the mosque to the people who are worshiping in the mosque. And the scarf I would carry with me in Istanbul to use when I'm visiting mosques is a small one like this. It can easily pack even into my pocket. And this is the way I would wear my scarf going into a mosque. Very casually, I will put it on my head and wrap it around my neck. This is it. Okay. My mosque going attire. And in streets of Istanbul, you can see several other kinds of styles. And the most common one, which is in fashion nowadays, is to cover all your hair, not leaving anything outside the scarf. Okay. Like and, this. And Lolly, in a conservative Islamic country where there was not a separation of mosque and state, in a theocracy, if you saw a woman who was uh, doing a news broadcast, she would be on TV with all of her hair covered, right? You would see a very yes. conservative, and that would be yes. the correct way to go from an orthodox Muslim point of view. Yes, it is, it is. Mm -hmm. And it uh, depends on the country, how much they would cover up, but yes, right. your observation is just right. And, um, but when you go outside the city, outside the metropolitan area and step into the rural countryside, into the farming communities, women would still cover their hair, but their main reason is practicality rather than the religious reasons. Think of our uh, farming women working in the fields in a dusty place under the sun. So they would wear a scarf like this. It is very fine cotton and you can see how fine it is. It's see-through very easily. Yeah. They would decorate the edges with crocheting's and beads. And the way to wear it would be like this. Huh. Oh, that's beautiful. So it's both practical and it's beautiful. Yes, it is. If it's very hot and very dusty, I can see why they would want that. And it's beautiful at the same time. You know, a lot of Americans, um, they're, they're sort of, they're, they're disturbed by Muslim women wearing a scarf. And I've got to remind, maybe because I'm a historian, I understand that societies are on a parallel track, but they're going at different speeds sometimes. And just a short period ago, Christian women covered their hair. Today, yes, a, a lot of Christian women still cover their hair. I mean, nuns, of course, the most um, devout Catholic women would cover their hair. Um, Jewish women have to wear a wig. Orthodox Jewish women cannot go in public after they're married with their hair showing. So they wear a wig in the same way you would wear, you might wear a scarf or, um, uh, or they wear a, a covering. So this is all a cultural thing and it's really exciting to be able to go out and to talk to people and to realize there's a reason for all of these traditions. Thank you. Now we're gonna go into, we were on a great opportunity to see a, a walking street. We're now gonna go to a popular area where people hang out and they just smoke on a big hookah and they play backgammon and they just have a great time. I love to make the scene in a spot like this in Istanbul. Turks love to meet and mingle at Ortakoy, just under the massive bridge that connected Europe with Asia in 1973. The temple of life in Turkey, like other Mediterranean lands, is slow enough to enjoy the moment and good friends. People love their tea, the sound of dice on the backgammon board, and sucking on the hookah, or nargile, generally a tobacco-free dried fruit smoke.
This city, so layered with rich history, was officially named Istanbul only in 1923 with the foundation of the modern Turkish Republic. Before that, it was called Constantinople. Over the centuries, this city has been the capital of two grand empires. The Byzantine Empire started in the 4th century and lasted until the 15th century. That's when the Ottomans took over and ruled until the end of World War I. Today, even though Turkey is governed from Ankara, Istanbul remains the financial, cultural and historic center of this country. As ancient Rome was falling, Emperor Constantine moved the capital from the west here to the less chaotic east in around 324 AD. It was named Constantinople in his honor. Then in 476, Rome and the Western Empire fell to invading barbarians. That left Constantinople the leading city of Western civilization. Traces of the Roman capital can still be found. This square was a racetrack, like the Circus Maximus in Rome. Built in the 4th century to seat over 60,000 fans, the Hippodrome was Constantinople's primary venue for chariot races. Its centerpiece, this 3,500-year-old ancient Egyptian obelisk, was originally carved to honor a pharaoh. It was moved here to ornament the racetrack in the 4th century. What you see today is only the upper third of the original massive stone tower. Hey, I just want to take a moment to uh, remind you that we could not do Monday Night Travel without our wonderful Monday Night Travel staff. And I want to thank Julianne Worden, uh, who's moderating tonight, and uh, uh, Gabe, who's behind the scenes, and Lisa, who is off tonight, and Ben, who is taking a break because he's studying in Moscow right now. We'll be, uh, we'll be getting some updates from Ben. He's spending nearly a year in Moscow on a study program. But I'm so thankful for the work that our Monday Night Travel staff does. Uh, also want to remind you, you're looking at clips from our shows that uh, we've done four shows on Turkey. That's two hours of Turkey. And if you want to watch those shows in their entirety and learn a lot more from Lolly, just go to ricksteves.com and go into the TV section and you can see the four shows we have on Turkey. Also, I want to remind you that we've got the Q&A widget going, and uh, I see we've already got 66 comments or questions there. If you have any question for Lolly, now's the time to put it in there because Julianne's going to field those questions, organize them, and we'll get to hear from Lolly after the video is done. You know, I'd like to take just a moment now to memorialize a dear friend of mine who really we wouldn't have a turkey tour program had I not met back in the 1980s. Um, Melika Saval passed away just a few years ago, but she was the most dynamic and inspirational guide. And she was a, a groundbreaking guide among women back when women could actually be in trouble if they showed so much um, passion and strength in the professional world. Lolly dedicated her or Melly dedicated her career to showing Americans Turkey and helping us better understand Turkey. And that was a long time ago. I'd like to just now show a few clips from Melly so we can remember the work that Melly did and what an important part of, of our career she is, at least indirectly, because she was the founder really of our Turkey tour program. Melly Sabal. Mother, Anna is any mother with the features of a good mother, loving, caring, nourishing, Anatolia means full of mothers. Not only were they able to build such a beautiful building, but they had gorgeous architecture. Double walls surrounded the library, air ventilated through, so insects and humidity would not deteriorate the scrolls of papyrus and parchment. The women of the Black Sea cover their head this way. In central Anatolia, the women choose another style. And my friend Naile, an Arab Turk, covers her hair this way. They've been here for one year. That's not the traditional nomad life. They used to be able to just take off and them. go and land yeah. wherever they wanted. Jesus Christ, God, Son, Savior, in Greek is Eus Christos, 
Sail. Use Sotir. It had a quarter of a million population. 250,000 people lived here. And can you imagine only 15% of it has been excavated? Meli was talking about Ephesus there, which is one of my very favorite ancient sites. And Melika wrote the guidebook to Ephesus back in the 1980s. And to give you an idea of the position of women back then, the publisher said, we shouldn't give you any royalties. This is just uh, an honor for you to write a book with us. And Meli wrote the book and uh, they kind of conned her out of all of her royalties. But Meli was that passionate at a time when a passionate woman really was at a huge disadvantage in Turkey. And thank God, women are in a much stronger state now, thanks to strong women in previous decades. Notice this gate. It has a Christian cross with a Muslim phrase, mashallah, in Greek letters. Mashallah is how we Muslims say, may God, Allah's blessings be on you. Our Prophet Muhammad said, don't tell me how well educated you are or how old you are. Tell me how much you have traveled, then I'll tell you how much you know. Melly basically lived on a tour bus and uh, she had so much joy of taking Americans around. And she, she took a lot of our tours around for the first five or six years of our Turkey tour program. And uh, it's just a big loss. And I just wanted to take a moment as we celebrate Turkey personally because I would never be able to do the tours of Turkey. I wouldn't have met Lolly. We wouldn't have had our tour company going had it not been for the good fortune I had to work with Melly back in the 1980s and 1990s. A good place to sample today's Turkish character is in Ankara, a small provincial town just a century ago. Today, Ankara, with over four million people, is the vibrant capital of a modern nation. The city is a thriving example of Turkey's new affluence, energized by busy boulevards, prestigious universities, and striking malls. Ankara is contemporary Turkey. If Turkey is more modern and comfortable with the West than other Islamic countries, it's because of its greatest statesman, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. This is the Mausoleum and Memorial Museum honoring the father of modern Turkey. Inside, the museum tells the story of this amazing man whose career started as a military hero. It's hard to overstate the importance of Ataturk. It's been said that the Turkish nation should thank God for Ataturk and thank Ataturk for everything else. Mustafa Kemal was a heroic leader in the First World War. After the war, he drove out the Allied occupation forces, overthrew the Ottoman Sultan, and saved Turkey from European colonization. Then in 1923, he established today's Turkish Republic. A grateful nation renamed him Ataturk, or Father of the Turks. As the first president of the Republic, he built the foundation of modern democracy here on the ruins of a corrupt empire. A long haul celebrates the impressive accomplishments of Ataturk. He separated mosque and state, emancipated women, replaced the Arabic script with Europe's alphabet, introduced Western-style industry, and legislated equality for all citizens. The memorial site is grandiose, with avenues of lions and formal guards giving visitors a sense of patriotism and nationalism. The mausoleum itself crowns the site like a grand temple, giving those who visit a feeling of reverence and respect. Pilgrims from all corners of Turkey stand before the tomb of Ataturk and remember the father of their nation. Hey, Lolly, I know you've been taking groups to Ataturk's mausoleum in Ankara for many years, and I know you're committed to this as an important part of the itinerary when we have a group looking at, quote, the best of Turkey. What does Ataturk mean to you, and, and what is it like for you as a guide to take Americans to this mausoleum? Um, thank you for this question, Rick. As a matter of fact, we feel very strong for Ataturk. Our feeling is 
uh, a humbling gratitude which can be expressed beyond the words. Mm. When you think of the World War I um, conditions, Ottomans lost the war and then Turkey or the lands the Turks had were subject to invasion by the winners of the World War I and Atatürk single-handedly spearheaded the mm. independence war which lasted for three years and out of the ashes of a fallen Ottoman Empire founded a modern nation. He was not only a military leader or a political leader, he was a true visionary. He was a challenger. He challenged all the norms of the age and the geography he lived in. He changed the society from top to toe. He gave rights to the women, which was unheard of, not only in the Muslim world, but around the globe. Turkish women are among the first in the whole world to have the right to vote and to run for office. It is as early as 1930s. And today, if I don't have to live in a burqa, I owe this to Atatürk. I can choose to live in a burqa, but I have other, um, other choices and which are all welcome. And if I have the education I have today, if I have the career I have today, it is all thanks to his visionary approach to the equality, the egalitarian system that he built. Wow, beautifully said, Lolly, and from the heart. You know, for us Americans, our George Washingtons and Thomas Jeffersons and so on were 250 years ago. And uh, it's hard to imagine that Turkey's George Washington, Turkey's father of modern Turkey, did his thing after World War I. And uh, it's also hard for us to imagine that Turkey was basically in the Middle Ages until World War I. And then after that, the Ottomans are gone and aggressive Turkish or aggressive European colonial powers just assumed they could gobble up Turkey and it would be their, their plaything. But no, Ataturk said, we are independent and now we're gonna pause, we're gonna reorganize and we're gonna be modern pluralistic society. And Ataturk did that with the true brute force of his personality and charisma and passion for Turkey. It's amazing to think that he said, okay, nobody's going to go to any church or mosque or synagogue. We're going to all learn to read and write. And then you can choose your own religion and it'll be separated from the state. That's pretty radical. And that's Ataturk. It is. Okay. It is. It was, he was a groundbreaking person. Wow. I'm just so moved. I, I'm just a sucker for Ataturk. And it's... um. It's a reminder that there are great people in, in modern times that have done such great things. And it's a, a thrill to go to this mausoleum and, and thank you for the leadership you have and the commitment. Because this next little bit, we're going to see a face montage of Turks. And when I think of how good life is in Turkey right now for so many people, I mean, everybody has their struggles and you're not living in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, that's for sure. But considering what's around you and considering what's been behind you, Times are pretty good. And when we look at these faces, I think we can uh, think uh, a lot of thankfulness for where Turkey is progressing. And we can also remember Ataturk. Check out these faces and think about a country as complicated and rich in history and culture as Turkey and what a joy it is to go there and play backgammon and suck on a, on a, on a hookah with people like this. Traveling here, we get to know that nation. And I find it's the faces that best tell the story. It's a land of diversity and contrast. A complex mix of people and history where old and new thrive side by side. The holy and the secular. Farmers and students. Villagers and hipsters. The young and old. Those who whirl when they pray and those who don't pray at all. Those who wear scarves and those who don't. Families, widows, couples, and kids. Traveling here, like traveling anywhere, the key ingredient of the experience is the people. Mm. Turkey fills the Anatolian Peninsula, and Anatolia is peppered with remnants of civilizations long gone. And around here, important sites are constantly being unearthed. Aphrodisias is a relatively recent excavation. The more they dig, the more many archaeologists believe that Anatolia, rather than Mesopotamia further to the east, is the cradle of our civilization. While this site goes back much further, what we see today is ancient Roman, 
only about 2,000 years old. This ornate gateway gives us a sense of this impressive city's former grandeur. And judging from its stadium, the town was really into sports. This is a proper stadium, one stadium long. That's about two football fields. Events like athletic contests, animal fights, and gladiator sports packed the house. This is one of the things I love about traveling in Turkey. Here in the middle of Anatolia, you can find an incredible ancient stadium, and it's all yours. The adjacent museum keeps the treasures of Aphrodisias safe and protected from the elements. Aphrodisias is named for Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love and beauty. Long before the Romans came, locals worshipped a mother goddess who eventually morphed into the Roman goddess of fertility, Aphrodite. The Three Graces, a scene repeated so many times throughout art history, were Aphrodite's loyal servants. Reliefs from the Temple of Sebastian lie in a particularly impressive wing of the museum. This temple, which dated to the 2nd century AD, honored Augustus and the deified emperors. It was lined with fine reliefs recalling both Greek myths and the triumphs of Roman emperors. Here, Emperor Claudius triumphs over Britain. And, not to be outdone, Nero has his way with Armenia. Like nearly all major ancient sites, its museum makes a stroll through the ruins more meaningful. After seeing those fine reliefs, the grandeur of the Temple of Sebastian is easier to appreciate. Mm. Whoa, do you remember being there, Lolly, with me and the crew? Yes, it feels like it was yesterday. That I just saw you reaching up and pointing to something, and I just thought, I love being there making a TV show with your guidance. You know, it was, it, it was, it's so fun to be able to be there with the camera. And I almost feel like making a pledge drive right now because it's so fun to be able to take my passion for Europe and connect with people like you with a passion for sharing your culture and then bringing it home to a part of American media where you can assume an attention span and where you can respect people's intelligence and where you can make TV content that's driven not by a passion for keeping advertisers happy, but that's driven just by a passion for reaching out and celebrating the world in all of its diversity. Looking at those faces, learning about Ataturk, walking through those beautiful ruins at Aphrodisias, you know, you've been guiding all over Turkey. What's your favorite ancient site to take people to? Um, ancient Greek and Roman site, you're asking us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Aphrodisias. I thought it might be. It's mine. I don't know. What, what is it about Aphrodisias? It's just an amazing place. It was a city of philosophers and artists. And everything that you still see on the streets of Aphrodisias today reflects this aspect. You can notice the touch of the artist. You can notice the um, intellectualism of the people that resided in the city once more. So the art was produced to, to, to keep those people happy. So it just, it just shines out from yeah. everything that you see. Plus, it was a city dedicated to Aphrodite. It's feminine. It, yes. The touch of the female, you can notice it there. So it's my most favorite ancient city. You know, I'm so thankful you connected that dot because there is something feminine and beautiful about Aphrodisias. It is. Hmm. There is. And it's blessed with a beautiful little museum where they've put all of the precious art they've found out of the acidic air that it can be preserved. And it's a beautiful experience to wander through the site and then cap it with a trip to the museum. Yes. I, so I, I remember wait, my word, Sherefe is toast, right? Sherefe? Yes, here's Sherefe. To, it here's to, means to your honor. To your honor. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah, here's to add a Turk. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that is just gorgeous. Lolly. We've been eating. How is your? How, it's almost breakfast time for you now. Yes, it is. 
Okay, I've been nibbling I've been, away at this for a long time. You got yours. Yes, but I've gonna, been munching on the eggplants. I'm going to give you an excuse now for the sake of teaching culture to move into the, your sweet course, your dessert. What, what, what yes. would you have? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Here, I have this delicious platter of assorted Turkish desserts and baklava. Baklava is a generic name for desserts made very thin layers of phyla dough that is stuffed with pistachios, hazelnuts, walnuts, or cream made from the milk of the water buffalo. Mm. So uh, when you say a traditional baklava, this would be it, the tra traditional baklava. Mm -hmm. But here at the center, we have what we call the pistachio dolma. Yes, and nice. it's a baklava. This one is an intense baklava with pistachios. What intense and baklava? Intense pistachio baklava. Okay. Baklava. More than usual. Nice. More pistachio than usual. These two at either side at the center line are pistachio rolls. Fustik sarma. So it's the same word, pistachio sarma. At the center, we have what we call the seashell baklava. It is filled with the cream of, made with the milk of the water buffalo. And at the uh, foreground, I have two innocent desserts. I call them innocent desserts because they don't have flour or uh, they don't have oil, no fat. Mm. This is a pumpkin. It's a pumpkin dessert soaked in honey. Uh -huh. And this is a fig dessert soaked in honey. And it comes with uh, walnuts in it. Mm. So it's a dolma stuffed it's still... with, it's a dolma, yes. It's stuffed with walnuts. Okay, so those are innocent. I, I'm sure the innocent are good, but I'll go for the guilty. I think that's a, a Billy Joel <laughs> song or something. I'm going to go for the guilty. And, uh, you know, when I'm looking at that, I've been talking to my computer screen here for the last 18 months a lot. And it's never occurred to me I want to crawl into that screen and go to what I'm looking at. But that's what I want to do with your plate of baklava right now. One of my favorite things to do when I was on a tour with you going through the best of Turkey was to go to those baklava shops where it's just a world, it's a whole shop full of various baklavas. Yes, I yes. love them too. Oh my goodness, I'm just, okay, um, come come back to your senses, Rick. We're, we're in a video show here. Uh, baklava, I'm jealous. I don't, all I have is, well, Rocky is pretty good, but it's, it's not baklava. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Lolly's drinking Rocky at six in the morning. <laughs> well, it's a fast start to the day. It's a fast start to the day. Hey, um, we're going to show next, Lolly, a little thing called the cutting room floor. Okay. And a lot of our people who like my show, they want to see what ended up on the cutting room floor. They want to see the stuff that didn't make it into the best 30 minutes. And we never know exactly how long our show is going to be when we bring it home. And typically, it's a couple minutes long. It's much better to have it too long than too short. So we have to cut it out. And here's a little bit of what didn't make the cut. And you can see it's not quite as good as the rest of the stuff, but it's awfully oh. nice. Let's see a little bit of turkey that hit the cutting room floor. Like most travelers, Lolly and I are catching the bus. The bus system here is great, connecting every major town with departures nearly all the time. The ride is cheap and comfortable. The attendant even helps you freshen up with a splash of scented water. And the scenery is both dramatic and fascinating. And like camel caravans in centuries past, it stops at a caravan sarai. A caravanserai was basically a fortified motel. This was a stop on the Silk Road, the fabled trade route connecting China with Europe. It was built in the 13th century when traders like Marco Polo counted on finding a safe place to stable the camels, enjoy a hearty meal, and get a good night's sleep. 
Caravanserais like this were located at Day's Camel Trek apart, along a route that stretched all the way from China to here. Six hours. Anatolia was the trader's gateway to Europe. In the shelter of a caravanserai, traders would spend firelit evenings gathered together telling stories, sharing information, and creating an oral tradition which helped shape the Turkish character. Lolly has a friend who lives nearby, and we're dropping in. By visiting a local family, we connect with real people and sample real life. I'm constantly struck by the genuine warmth of the Turkish people. Cooking's done in holes in the rock, as it has been since ancient times. And the technique seems timeless as well. Hot coals and pottery. So, Lolly, that's a, a, a hole in the ground, and there are some live coals, some hot coals, and uh, they put a pot in there with whatever they're cooking, and it just, the pot sits on the coals, and they cook it that way. Also, I saw, I think I saw, like, pizza crust slapped onto the side of the oven. Is that also how they cook the bread there? Uh, yes, but it's not coal, Rick. It's wood fire. Oh, it's a wood fire. Okay. It is wood fire, yes. And uh, they, you can put a pot, earthenware pot of food mm -hmm. in it to be cooked, or you can stick the flat breads on the side walls so it would cook with the heat slowly, but it will not burn with the fire. Okay, because I remember in my, you know, when I'm in Eastern Turkey, I don't, there's no turnstiles. You don't wonder what time is the museum open. You just walk around and you observe. And if you see a bakery, it's got a big one of those un, uh, holes with wood fire. And then it's got a lot of bread slapped on the side of this big, like giant underground jug. And yes. they peel it off when it's cooked and it's fresh. It's the fresh bread. It's, it's kind of this, isn't it? It is, it is more than what you have. It is this. It's the ekmek. It, this is what I have is lavash. It's a flat bread. Okay, nice. So that's so beautiful. We saw that right here in this family's um, domestic kitchen. Yes. Wow. We gather together on the floor. Well, very simple. It's homey and plenty comfortable. And sitting down with three generations to share a convivial meal creates yet another lifelong memory. These were complete communities. Many of the surviving caves were churches carved into the rock. A reminder that for many centuries before Islam arrived, this region was Christian. Churches like this one in Gureme were carved to recreate features of freestanding Byzantine buildings. A central dome, vaulted ceilings, pillars and arches with no structural purpose provided the cave worshiper the atmosphere of a traditional church. The painted domes and walls also copy the elaborate mosaic decorations in Byzantine churches with Christ occupying the most important position. Much of the painting survives from the Middle Ages. It tells stories from the life of Jesus who's always depicted with the cross in his halo. In the Transfiguration, Jesus, holding a scroll of the gospel or good news, appeared to his disciples in a form more glorious than just a man. He was now a deity. This graphic crucifixion has every character labeled in Greek. Hmm. The betrayal of Judas shows Jesus ready for that fateful kiss. And at the Last Supper, with Christ at the head of the table, the fish, an early symbol of the Christian faith that endures to this day, is clearly the main course. Wow, that's pretty good, but it didn't make the cut. That's interesting stuff. There are so many interesting sites to see in Turkey if you know where to look. 
Now we're going to go to a little town called Guzeliert. It's in the middle, the deep center of the country, almost no tourism. This was one of my original back doors, the places I, I, I found that just to me were the perfect opportunity to connect with the culture, to be there as a guest rather than part of the economy. A town like this is just like an made-to-order classroom for Turkish culture. And you can imagine what a thrill it is for guides like Lali and her staff to take one of our groups there and to introduce them to the raw, um, just intimate, you know, catch turkey by surprise slice of this beautiful land. Join us now in Guzeliert. The name Guzeliert is literally beautiful land. We're heading further south to the remote and untouristy town of Guzeliert. The ancient town seems one with the rock out of which it was carved. 16 centuries ago, monks built monasteries into the cliffside. Erosion has driven most of the residents here to more stable dwellings, but some remain. And exploring the town, you appreciate the tenacity of its people. Though seemingly abandoned, there's still life in the old town. Residents somehow eke out a living from its crumbling terraces and neglected gardens. People do their humble chores, as if stubbornly refusing to give up on their town. Lolly, what do you think about Gazelliard? It is just, is it, it, am I just crazy or is it just a beautiful place? <laughs> it, it is a beautiful place. You are not crazy. And uh, the intensity of the culture, the history, the heritage there brings me goosebumps. Even when I, when I think about it, not only when I go there. Yeah. In fact, you and, and Tan have a hotel nearby, don't you? Yes, close by in another village in Cappadocia. So you must like Cappadocia from a- Very much, Yeah. very much. The hotel was, as a matter of fact, our retirement project. Yeah, well, we've got a link to your hotel there and I've stayed there with our groups and it's a yes. beautiful home base for exploring this kind of area. By the way, when I make a TV show, I get one little chance to um, plug my books. I like to let people know that everything we shoot on these TV shows is accessible. Uh, this is an ethic of ours. We don't shoot it if you can't do it yourself, but it does help to have the guidebook that helps you find all of these places. So here's an example of the little plug that I'm able to give in the middle of the TV show. This is the kind of discovery I love to feature in my guidebooks. It's a perfect back door. Almost no tourism, lots of history, and plenty of character. Today, like Turkey in general, Gazilyurt is Muslim. But for centuries, Christians worshipped here. And the city has an interesting connection with Turkey's neighbor to the west, Greece. Until the early 20th century, Greece and Turkey were both part of the Ottoman Empire. There were Muslim communities in Greece and Greek Orthodox communities here in Turkey. Like many Turkish towns, Gözelyurt was once a Greek town. Then in the 1920s, they had a huge population swap. Most Christians here were moved to Greece, and Muslims there were sent to Turkey. That's why Gözelyurt's historic church is now a mosque. Today, its single minaret indicates that this is a valley where the people call God Allah. Above that 1,600-year-old church are Selçuk arches, Ottoman facades, and on the horizon gleams the tin dome of the main modern mosque. The market square is the heart of Gazelyurt. It's busy with people enjoying petite glasses of sweet chai and the happy clatter of backgammon dice. No, uh, six, six, six. <laughs> that's good. Look at that. Boom, boom. An easy way to have fun with locals is over a game of backgammon, a daily treat for me anywhere in Turkey. If you don't know how to play, it's no problem. If you pause, someone will likely move for you. Nice, huh? Good. <laughs> nice game, thank you. Very good. <laughs> my partner, my good. Okay, there's some, look at this, that, that captures it right there. Okay, 
I'm a travel writer, I'm a TV host, doesn't matter, anybody can do this. It's That's what I wanna stress. You've got to sit down and challenge somebody to a game of backgammon. Lolly, let's talk about backgammon for just a minute. I just I just love backgammon. Uh, what's back, do, do most people play backgammon in, in Turkey? Of course, everybody knows how to play backgammon. Adult or child, women or men, it's like playing hopscotch for us. <laughs> So is it reasonable for a tourist to step in and, and um, would he be welcome or she be welcome to play? Very much. And it's very reasonable. And I encourage it very much. Once our visitors step out towards the locals, the visitor takes one step and the locals would take 10 steps to come closer. And I definitely recommend it very much. That's a beautiful way of saying that. If you take one step toward them, they'll take 10 steps towards you. They yes. want the... They, if everybody is stiff and, and closed, then nothing will happen. If the tourist opens up, all of a sudden, we're together. Yes. And yes. I find a game of backgammon is perfect. And, they, and it's, what about a woman? If a woman was traveling, an American woman, could she, would she be welcome at a table like that? Uh, in the country, uh, in the metropolitan areas, yes, she mm -hmm. definitely would be. But in the traditional small villages, tea houses are mostly male dominant. Okay, so if she goes there with a male companion, maybe a host, maybe a friend, then she'd be welcome. But oh. it would be awkward for a single woman to walk into one. So that's a good advice, and you need to be aware of the the the, the cultural sensibilities in exactly. a big city. In a big city, it's more modern. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. You know what this is. Your gift from Turkey. This is my very favorite souvenir. Look at that. Can you see it? Yes. Uh -huh. Oh, I it's love a, it. It's a traditional tavla. It's a traditional backgammon board. It still smells like tobacco and tea. And just, it's a tea house. It's a Turkish tea house here in a, in a box. The rusted little uh, hinges, the, the handmade dice, the inlaid wood the the white the light wood is lighter than the dark wood so it's worn down further i got this for just a couple bucks in a town like that and it's one of the treasures in my in, of souvenirs and uh it's just a reminder that backgammon tabla shishbish whatever you want to call it <laughs> yes you're exactly right shishbish is the right word to use Shishbish. That's, I think, when they say in Iran, it means five and six, right? Yes, Shishbish. five and six. It's Shishbish. a Persian. Five Persian. and six in Persian. That's, oh, I know two Persian words. That's great. All right. Hey, let's carry on here. Thanks for the information about Shishbish. <laughs> and my friendly opponent, Kadir, is taking us to meet his family. <laughs> Greetings are warm but formal as is the norm in Muslim households, leave your shoes at the door. The eldest gets the most respect. A splash of cologne leaves us refreshed and clean. Tea making is given great importance and done with pride. And good luck if you want it without sugar. As things loosen up, I share pictures of my children. But now she's quite big. She's like you, about like that, yeah. The daughters add to the fun, and we enjoy a little Turkish fashion show. And the grandfather entertains with tales of 30 years of shepherding. For me, intimate encounters like these are as rewarding as visiting the great museums. Before we leave Gazelyurt, we've got an appointment with the imam back at the old church. Originally the Church of St. Gregory, this was first built in 385 AD. While Christians worshipped here 1,600 years ago, today it functions as a mosque. The imam has agreed to a short interview. Imam means teacher. He'd be the equivalent of a Christian pastor. Thank you for allowing us to be in your mosque. The government pays your wage. How do you contribute to your community? He says that my primary duty is to lead the prayer in the mosque, which means that they're also the caretaker of the mosque, mm -hmm. and give information to the people whenever they want to have some religious education, information. So be available to them to answer questions. We don't have regular work hours. We have to be alert 24-7. Um, 
meet the needs of the community when there is the wedding, when there is the funeral, when there is a circumcision, when they're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Imam is among the very first people they would seek for help, advice. Five times every day I hear the call to prayer. It says, God is great, there is one God, he is Allah, Muhammad is his prophet. Does that mean Muhammad is the only prophet or the last prophet? And where does that leave Jesus? It is our faith to believe in all prophets. Kesinlikle Hz. Muhammed, Hz. İsa, Hz. İbrahim, Hz. Musa, hiçbir arasında fark yok. There is no difference to us between Muhammad, Moses, Abraham or Jesus. Hz. Muhammed'i son peygamber olarak... The only difference is we recognize Muhammed as the last prophet. Okay. If you could share one message to the United States of America, what would that be? He requests that people do not believe the distorted view of Islam, but try to understand and learn what really it is. Islam eşittir terörizm görmesinler. He requests people not to see Islam equals to terrorism, because it is not. When the Imam calls the people to pray, He's saying, God is great, there is one God, and Muhammad is his prophet. This global wave of praise races as fast as the sun five times a day across Islam, from Malaysia to Morocco and beyond. Throughout Islam, fundamentalism is on the rise. Many Turks see this as a threat to their democracy. Modern-minded Turks, while still Muslims, want their government to preserve the separation of mosque and state. In fact, a constitutional obligation of Turkey's military is to overthrow its own government if ever it becomes a theocracy. It's a complicated issue, and there is a rising tide of fundamentalism here among Turks. But the people I've met seem determined to maintain the secular ideals of Ataturk. Lali, I'm fascinated at the opportunity for you and your Turkish guides to take a group of Americans into that mosque, sit on the carpet, and meet that wonderful imam. What is that like for you? Do you, is it, um, is he comfortable with the groups? Do you feel like the groups are, are getting a lot out of the visit? I think so. And it's, it's one of the uh, people's experiences I very much look forward to while on the tour because uh, see I am an individual person and I have an opinion and my opinion does not necessarily respect what everybody on the street think of but Imam from a religious point of view and the way he understands and practices uh, Islam represents more of the Turkish people. And uh, this gives Imam to express himself mm -hmm. and to express what majority of the people on the streets of Turkey think about Islam. And uh, during this event, as guides, we only work as interpreters between our tour members and the Imam. So we, um, we translate questions and answers uncensored this way, tour members can ask any question they want, and they can hear the answer from the imam directly. And this is an excellent cultural exchange between Turks and the Americans. It's just, it's something that I very much look forward to. And imams cherish it, mm. cherish the idea that they have a chance to speak to the people from the country, and they come from around the world. It's just amazing. Can yeah. you just have imagine um, the priest of a church in Central America having chance to talk to a Turkish audience? Oh, it's wonderful. And it is the service that you provide of not being uh, the uh, the teacher, not being the guide, not having the bully pulpit, but to be the dispassionate, very un uh, very um, almost robotic translator so that yeah. the questions are asked and the answers are heard without you getting in the way because exactly. he has his perspective and it's a beautiful thing for him and for the tourists. Exactly, I think so. These are the kind of rich experiences that we work very hard and we've been doing this for more than 20 years to make sure when people take our best of uh, 
Turkey tour or our best of uh, Istanbul tour, they get a rich experience they, they might not get elsewhere. Even if you're an independent minded traveler, a very capable independent traveler, Turkey is one place I, I highly recommend having the help of a guide. As long as the guide is interested in giving you these kind of experiences rather than just taking you shopping and seeing the cliches on stage. See, sites and every, you can Google everything now. What yeah. you cannot Google is the people's experiences. That's so true. Lolly, thank you so much. Julianne, I think we're ready for some questions. Lolly, that was so much fun. What do we have, Julianne? Great, we have a lot of great questions. That was a really fun show. Um, but before we get to those, can we have a word from our sponsor? A word from our sponsor. Well, thank you for the opening. I've been sharing the sponsor message a little bit this evening, but I do have a one minute little video tease about our tour program, the tours that Lolly and her guides lead of ours around Turkey. Can I show that? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Let me show you that and then we'll get into the Q&A. But here's a one minute promo for the Rick Steves Best of Turkey Tour led by Lolly and her crew. Turkey is bursting with lifelong memories. And with the help of a passionate Turkish tour guide, touring here is a great opportunity to experience a moderate Islamic democracy. I find the best of Turkey is the most rewarding of all our tours. You'll marvel at Istanbul's Blue Mosque, the Hagia Sophia, and the Grand Bazaar. Then, venturing deep into Anatolia, you'll explore Cappadocia's very chimney landscape. Ponder the ancient Greek sites of Ephesus and Aphrodisias, and be dazzled by the sparkling water of the Mediterranean. You'll also experience legendary Turkish hospitality firsthand, from artisans to imams. If you're looking to maximize your memories and come home with a broader worldview, that's what the best of Turkey is all about. In fact, we're, you know, we have a tradition of every winter letting our guides take one of our tours. And it's our guide sort of a vacation. And uh, in about a month, uh, about 20, 22 or 24 of our Rick Steves uh, tour guides from all over Europe are going to get together. And one of Lolly's lead guides, Mert, is going to show this group around Turkey. They're going to be tour members on a best of uh, Turkey tour. And it's really fun for our guides to actually get into that mode of, hey, they're overwhelmed, they're confused, it's a wonderful, it's exciting, what do I do next? It's a chance for them to empathize better with what it's like to be a tour member in a foreign country. I'm just so excited about this. And Lolly, I think that tour is booked and ready to go. Yes, it's going to be by, uh, in November. And I'm very excited about it. And all my colleagues not only come to Turkey, but also will come to my home. Oh, so much. That's so much to look forward to. Okay. Julianne, let's have some questions for Lolly, please. Okay, well, our first question, we just saw that video clip of the Imam seeing the call to prayer, which was really neat to see. And Wendy was, Wendy was wondering, what is the appropriate response for tourists if they're in a city or a town during the call to prayer? Should they do something in particular? Nothing. We don't do anything either. Mm -hmm. It's just you carry on whatever you are doing. Yeah. <laughs> it is funny. It's because like hearing a church bell walking on the street. You get a cacophony. I, I don't use the word cacophony very much, but cacophony is the perfect word for 10 different minarets doing the call of prayer mm -hmm. almost at the same time. And mm -hmm. you just, the whole world, dogs are howling and you just feel like this. It's just, and you can ignore it. Some people can be annoyed by it. Other people, they take a moment to pray. It's a As a matter prayer. of fact, we don't even notice it most of the time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that's good to know. Thank you for sharing. Um, and the next question, it sounds like we have some guides going to um, Turkey in November, but Lali, what would you say is the best time to visit Istanbul or Turkey? Best time can be subjective, depends on your purpose of travel. If you want to travel in a temperate climate, moderate climate, um, which would be, I would say, 70s, 70 Fahrenheit, around 70, 75 Fahrenheit, then I would say early spring or mid to late fall would be ideal. But there's also the fact Turkey is quite popular in means of international tourists now. Um, 
Visiting at the most popular time, which would be spring and fall, means that you would be waiting in lines in the museums and they would be crowded. Personally, I most like uh, the off the off the season time to travel, which would be winter. The days are shorter, but then you don't wait on the you don't wait in the line and you get the places almost to yourself. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a personal choice to make. Yeah, I was thinking it would be beautiful to see aphrodisias, if I'm pronouncing that right, in the spring, like maybe in the video, but oh, in the winter, I bet it would be. Aphrodisias is mm -hmm. always empty. It's an off the beaten oh, path okay. site. It doesn't matter what time of the year you are there. You're yeah. hardly, it's it's very hard to come across crowds there. Yeah. Well, we yeah. should remind people it's it's it can be bitter cold in the winter. So uh, in the middle of the Anatolia. Yes. So wear your ski coat. Exactly. <laughs> and we had quite a few viewers uh, watching tonight, like Clarissa, who is wondering, is it safe for um, women traveling alone to visit Turkey? Yes, absolutely it is. Mm -hmm. And um, big cities are very comfortable where people would stay and sightsee. They are very modern. They are um, very, uh, they are geared towards visitors. So a single woman can very easily travel in the big cities and in the interstates between cities to cities using the public transportation. Uh, the countryside is particularly safe. As a matter of fact, there are some villages we stay on the tour, which doesn't have a police force because there's no crime. Wow. Imagine so that. yes, I would recommend uh, single women not to hesitate traveling to Turkey. That's great. I, I would love to go to Turkey. So that's exciting to know that it's- And actually, <laughs> Julian, I, I've had that question for 30 years mm -hmm. in my lectures, and I've always said the same thing Lolly just said. And I've only had people thankful that they were encouraged to go to Turkey. So, you know, some women might not be comfortable alone in a big city in America after dark. That's understandable. They might be less comfortable traveling alone in a place like Turkey. But a lot of women are, are um, comfortable in the streets in, in the United States. And if you're comfortable in a big city here, you'd be comfortable in Turkey as well. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, somewhere yes. around the world. And mm -hmm. Lolly, I noticed behind you that you have an evil eye. Do you know the history behind, can you share the history or the story behind evil eye? Yes, of course. It's, a, uh, it's, it's known to be Turkish at the moment, but it's a symbol of Asia Minor. Mm -hmm. Today's Turkey is the historic Asia Minor. And it's, uh, it's a sign that had appeared about 4,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. People mostly consider it as a good luck charm, but the way it came to a being and continued to be used, it's rather than being a good luck charm, it catches the evil looks, catches the evil spirits. So it's like a lightning rod, but an evil eye rod catching the evil eye so it doesn't hurt you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I want to get one <laughs> myself. <laughs> Actually, I do have a refrigerator magnet from Greece downstairs that's an evil eye now that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Um, let's see here. Um, we saw so much great food tonight, and Leif was wondering, what is a traditional Turkish breakfast? Hmm. We, are, we love our breakfast, and uh, it's a major course for us. Um, we would have one or two or three kinds of cheese with it. We would have olives. Turkey is an olive growing country. Cheese and olives are breakfast food for us. We would have both green olives and black olives. We would have honey, we would have butter, we would have jam, we would have definitely an egg scrambled or fried or boiled. And uh, we would have Turkish tea, let me show you. As a matter of fact, I have a cup here since it's almost breakfast oh, time for me. I love those this, cups. This is a Turkish tea glass for us. We would have tea with our breakfast and definitely cucumbers and tomatoes. Hmm. And optionally, you can have cheese rolls or you can have savory pastries, and of course, bread to go with all of these. So imagine a nice hotel has a huge buffet with all of those things, and then they've got the American things also, and you have, yes. a, big, you have a big choice. Didn't yes, Mohammed, yes. was it, did I remember Mohammed would break his fast by eating an olive, is that true? And olives, an olive or a date, one or the other. Okay, because I always, I like when I'm in Islam to break my fast with an olive. I think about Mohammed and I have an olive. It's a beautiful first thing to eat as you start the day, I think. Well, 
Okay, let's see here. And our last question for tonight. Um, Lolly, do you have a favorite memory from guiding uh, Rick Steve's tour from all the years you've been oh, a guide? Wow. I have many, many. Um, but from the top of my head right now, I guess it would be 9-11. 9-11. Um, we, I was with a Rick Steves group. We were down in the city of Antalya by the Mediterranean. It was a wonderfully cheerful day we had. We had a boat trip, swam in the Mediterranean, enjoyed sunbathing and wonderful Turkish food. And we were in that cheerful mood. We got back to the hotel and we were laying around the lobby. The TV was on and all of a sudden, the viewings of the 9-11 start showing up on the screen. It, it, it was very impactful. It's just, at that moment, I was not a single person. I was not Lali, the tour, tour members, they were not individuals, but we all came one human being and we all felt a huge sorrow that it's, it's mind boggling. It's, it's hard to express with words. Mm. yes that's that would be the one i think the most standing out wow thank you for sharing that lolly i would that same day i remember oh. i was in the italian riviera in the cinque terra and it was september is the busiest time of year all of our tour guides were busy with our groups and i had the same feeling you said it so eloquently we were all one person we were all together italians guides tour members it was an amazing moment wasn't it if more of us traveled, the world would understand each other better. That's something that, that, oh, that is a, the foundation of our teaching. That's our mission, is we want to reach out and get comfortable with this planet and, and better understand. Can I add one more thing to Rick? Please Can do. I add one more thing? Please do. When Americans travel to Turkey, they don't only get to learn about Turkey, but they also teach about American people, what they stand for, their values, their morals. It is, it is just so incredible that the windows of, of opportunity that people's experience open for one another, both mm. for our travelers and the local hosts we have in Turkey. Mm. That's so important to remember. It's a two-way thing. When we travel, exactly. we exactly. bring the culture to exactly. Turkey or wherever we travel and when and vice versa. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Exactly. Lolly, thank you very much for joining us today. I know you gave up half your night's sleep to be with us. I know you wear your t-shirt very proudly. I love your t-shirt. Yes. Keep on traveling. And we're going to do exactly that. So we want to thank everybody for joining us. And Lolly, here's to you and all of your friends in Turkey I, and your beautiful family. I, I wish you the best. Şerefe. Thank you, Rick. Şerefe. And I want to remind you, <laughs> we got Monday Night Travel coming up every week. I'm going to be in Europe for the next three Mondays. But next week, Cameron Hewitt is going to take us to Iceland. The week after that, Stefan from Bulgaria is going to take us around his homeland. And then after that, our Monday night travel crew, Julianne, Gabe, and Lisa are going to join with Cameron and share their experience, their favorites. And that's going to be a beautiful evening together. So don't miss it. We love to see you every Monday. And right now, instead of going to bloopers, a lot of times we close out with bloopers, I'm going to take you to a hotel in Cappadocia. And uh, late at night, before we go to bed, a lot of us have been having a little rocky and the hoteliers have done their work. They pull out their musical instruments and whether there's tourists are there or not, I get a sense that there's just a joy and the joy expresses itself in dancing. And it's easy to dance in Turkey. I have found, because I've been doing it ever since I was a teenager. You just shake your shoulders, you snap your hands <laughs> and you get up and you try to wear out one of those Turkish carpets, all right? So we're just gonna dance like nobody's watching here. Forgive me, it's a little bit goofy. I was just holding my iPhone and having a great time, but it's done with a joyful spirit and it's with a joyful spirit that we travel together every Monday. Thanks again, Lolly. Happy travels to everybody. And now let's dance.
Good night, Lolly. Good night, Rick. Good night, Gabe. Hey, Rick. And good night, Julianne. Good night, Rick. And Rick, who are these special guests running around in the background tonight? <laughs> the furry <laughs> friends. <laughs> <laughs> Those are my little buddies, <laughs> Jackson and Gracie. And um, they've never traveled much. Yeah. <laughs> they, they taught me the joy of not traveling, I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good night. Good night. Good night, everyone.